warfare, air superiority is essential. To control the skies, air forces have built the most highly evolved military machines ever made. Strike planes that can deliver lethal force anywhere, anytime. Now designers are creating a new breed of strike planes that will be able to carry out their mission with unparalleled superiority. These new generation aircraft will be faster, deadlier and stealthier than ever before. This plane, the F-15 Eagle, was built for one purpose and one purpose only, total air superiority. It was created to combat the threat posed by the Soviet MiG fighters during the height of the Cold War in the 70s and was the first strike plane that could detect and kill from many miles away as well as engage in dogfights. It's still in operation today and in 30 years of active service it has never been beaten in air-to-air -air combat. It's the benchmark by which all modern strike planes are judged. The F-15 saw active service in both Gulf Wars and is now keeping the peace patrolling the skies above the west coast of America, with the Oregon Air National Guard constantly on the lookout for any threat to the US's national security. I'm Mo Gass, a major in the Oregon Air National Guard, and I fly the F-15. My name is Paul Fitzgerald. I'm an F-15 pilot for the Oregon Air National Guard. Former airline pilots Major Dale Bennett, known as Mogas, and Major Paul Fitzgerald, known as Snap, have been stationed at the Air National Guard for three years. They are on alert night and day and maintain their readiness with regular training sorties in their F-15s. The F-15 uh, is a pretty incredible airplane, actually. Uh, uh, thinking about its uh, design was uh, in the late 50s, 60s came off the production line in the mid 70s uh, so it's been around for quite some time it's a pretty uh, powerful airplane it was actually built to, to rule the skies and strictly in an air superiority type of a, a role and uh, it has not lost in battle yet and I don't think it, uh, it's gonna lose anytime soon the F-15 comes in four versions including a bomber but the most successful is the air-to-air -air combat fighter like those flown by Mogas and Snap it's a pretty big airplane. It was actually built to house the radar that uh, lives in the nose. The airplane is about 43 feet tall, about 63, 64 feet long, and at the tail it's just under uh, 20 feet high. So it's a pretty large airplane. It's been akin to the size of a tennis court. As well as patrolling the skies for intruders, the pilots of the Air National Guard also carry out training exercises. Mogas and Snap are planning a simulated dogfight where they will objectives practice locking their weapon systems the onto each other. Objectives for the blue air is quick kill. As Being as a frontline fighter front pilot is a hazardous job. Every time they fly, they may encounter the enemy and have to deploy lethal force. My mission then is to uh, turn them into hair, teeth, and eyeballs. Uh, realistically, uh, it's you know it's kill or be killed. Uh, and, and fortunately, I think all of us have, uh, have resolved ourselves to the fact that uh, uh, you're taking out the other guy's airplane. If he has a good ejection seat, uh, then it's a good day for him. If he doesn't have a good ejection seat, then that's one of the dangers and the, the threats that we live with. The F-15 was the first strike plane with the ability to take out an opponent up close or from miles away. We have two arenas we normally fight in. It's within visual range and then, of course, beyond visual range. Uh, within visual range, I have a 20-millimeter uh, cannon that's in the, the right wing root of the airplane. Once you start moving into a, a little bit further out, uh, out into miles and so, uh, we start talking about the uh, heat-seeking missile. And then once you get beyond that range, uh, now you start talking about the advanced medium-range air-to-air missile that we use, uh, otherwise known as the AMRAAM. The real benefit uh, of the AMRAAM is uh, its ability to really get out there and reach out and, and touch someone and uh, turn them into pieces and parts. The F-15 has two giant engines producing a combined thrust of 46,900 pounds between them, capable of pushing the plane to a top speed of 3,000 kilometers an hour. The thrust that you get out of these airplanes gets you off the ground fast and gets you to where you need to get fast. 
the biggest advantage having a great thrust to weight ratio uh, is the ability to uh, power through a turn and uh, to not only turn as quick as you can uh, but also to be able to sustain that turn in combat it, it might take uh, in order to kill the enemy it might take three or four uh, 360 degree turns uh, in order to successfully get behind them and get into a weapons engagement zone and, and to uh, either shoot a missile off or to, to shoot the gun. But turning at high speeds exerts massive pressure right, and a g-force on the pilot, 1g being the force of normal gravity. When the pilot makes a high G turn, the weight of their body is multiplied by the same number. Six and a half right there. At six and a half Gs, a 76 kilogram pilot would feel as if he weighed six and a half times as much, nearly 500 kilograms. In order to be able to cope with the nine Gs that the airplane will pull and actually sustain for a little bit of time, uh, they give us several different pieces of equipment to help that happen. That's uh, the combat edge vest. Uh, it fills up with air keeps the internal pressure in your in your chest cavity uh, so the blood it can actually get pushed out of your chest cavity and into your head. Uh, most important is your G-pants too, uh, G-suit otherwise known as. Uh, it tightens up, it also moves the blood from your lower extremities into your, into your uh, chest then obviously to try to keep the blood in your head so that you can keep blood in your eyes so that you can see and think. The color goes out of your vision first. Uh, the second thing that goes is obviously you have tunnel vision and that's followed by stages of going unconscious and that's the whole reason we're trying to avoid that. You don't want to be manipulating the controls of an airplane when you're unconscious. The pilots also wear a helmet with an oxygen mask in case the cockpit were to depressurize at high altitude. But the F-15 is getting old. During every flight, the aging aircraft perform extreme maneuvers and put the airframe under enormous stress. As a result, planes require constant maintenance. more than just a pilot to run an F-15. Behind the scenes is a team of over 30 highly skilled personnel just to keep each plane in the air. The precise age of the plane determines the level of maintenance required. This airplane is 20 years old and with that the unique challenges are that the metal is always going under a tremendous amount of stress and it wasn't uh, designed to last as long as it has but we continually x-ray all the metal parts and uh, on an hourly inspection cycle highly scrutinize the airplane for metal fatigue and uh, even the engines for any possible uh, signs of wear and tear that might make or indicate there could be a problem in flight. For every hour in flight, the plane requires at least 10 hours of maintenance, including engine testing here in the Hush House. A team of engineers can remove an engine from a plane and have it in the test facility in under an hour. The skill of the maintenance team ensures that the planes are airworthy when pilots Mogas and Snap go out on exercises. No pilot wants mechanical failure when engaging the enemy at 10,000 metres. F-15 pilots Mogas and Snap from the Oregon Air National Guard are going on a dogfight training exercise. They are going to simulate shooting an intruder out of the sky by locking on to each other in a mock dogfight. Before the flight, each pilot carries out one final check to make sure that his plane is airworthy. The F-15 first flew in 1972. Over 1,200 were built and now there are still over 500 flying on active duty. So you have an airplane that's been around for 30 years and, uh, and still there's, there's countries out there that are still trying to build airplanes to counter this airplane specifically. And I think that's attributed to the continual attention this airplane's been given over the years to keep it at cutting edge. Two uh, 
AB climb to 15,000 is approved. Departure end cable indicates up. Wind 260 at 6, runway 28 left, clear for takeoff, change to departure. Well, guys, one clear for takeoff with quick climb and say again the freak for departure. Departure frequency 299.2 for MOGAS 1 and 2. 299.2 for MOGAS, MOGAS push 9. By the time you get down to the end of the runway, you're doing uh, three, four, five hundred miles an hour, and then you can basically just take off straight up into the air. It's quite a sensation. It's, it's like being on the tip of a rocket. By the time you reach the end of the runway, your gear's up, your flaps are up, and you're ready to pull and go straight up in the air. You're ready to pull a nice 7G turn straight up uh, to go uh, vertically. And you, can get, you can get up in a hurry that way. It'll certainly wake you up in the morning. Anytime you use afterburner, you're going to increase your IR or your infrared or your heat signature. The infrared or heat exhaust signature makes the F-15 vulnerable to heat-seeking missiles fired from the ground or enemy planes. You're also uh, using a heck of a lot more gas because it's raw fuel in order to get that uh, afterburner working. So uh, you have a fuel disadvantage by having to use it, and obviously you have a uh, heat signature disadvantage. Once they reach 10,000 metres, Mogas and Snap start their dogfight training exercise. They take turns being the hunter and the hunted. and attempts to lock on its weapons guidance systems. Once the hunter plane locks on, he registers a kill. And there's a gun strike kill right there. A strike for Mogas. Had this been a real intruder, they'd now be nothing more than charred metal and smoke. Even though the F-15 is well past its shelf life, it will continue to be the US Air Force's premier air-to-air -air strike fighter until its successor comes into service in 10 years' time. I believe it still does rule the skies. There's uh, specific uh, airplanes that do other things probably a little better, uh, but when you take the overall package and you talk about the overall airplane, it's still a top contender in the world and uh, probably will continue to be until we bring the new one online. A beautiful airplane. I don't think that uh, in the history of, of mankind, I don't think we will ever build a more beautiful airplane, and it's just a real joy to fly. The F 15 has proved itself in combat time and time again, but it does have one huge disadvantage. Because of its size and weight, it requires a two and a half kilometer long That's runway. And this means that it can't operate from small airfields close to the battlefield. This problem was cracked by the British when they came up with the Harrier Jump Jet, a plane that needs no runway at all. It can do things that no other in service jet plane can perform. Take off vertically. It can take off with a short runway. It can even hover. Built originally in the 1960s, the Harrier Jump Jet revolutionized fighter plane design. Over 800 Harriers have been in service around the globe, taking off from land and sea. My name is Squadron Jim Provost. Uh, I'm a Harrier pilot on one squadron. I've been flying for approximately 12 years um, and I joined the Harrier in 1994. The Harrier concept came about many, many years ago during the Cold War. Uh, its design was to be able to take off from very short surfaces, uh, to land vertically uh, in case there were no runways to make use of. 
and we're talking about a concept that was in the 50s and yet it's still going into the 21st century. What makes the Harrier special is the fact that it can, it can land vertically, it can land on a ship, it can land in a clearing in a wood, uh, which makes it very special. The reason that the Harrier can perform these incredible manoeuvres is its extraordinary engine system. There are two air intakes, but only one powerful Rolls-Royce Pegasus engine. The first point to note is that uh, there's only one engine on the Harrier. Uh, people often make the mistake of thinking that there are four, but there aren't. You see through the intake here, this is the, uh, the Pegasus engine. It's a big engine uh, and provides all of the thrust for the aircraft. If you look down the right-hand side, we can see what we call the nozzles. We've got a hot nozzle at the back here and a cold nozzle at the front. Uh, same on both sides, so we have four nozzles that take the thrust from, uh, from the one engine. What that does, it, it provides um, normal thrust for forward flight, just like any other fast jet. Uh, and if we bring the nozzles down, which you can control from the cockpit, uh, that gives you your thrust for your vertical landings and your vertical takeoff. The plane's entire weight is balanced on the downward thrust of its engine. When the uh, Harrier comes to the hover, uh, obviously most of the thrust goes from the engine to the four nozzles uh, on the fuselage. Uh, what we need to do once it's in the hover is control it. Uh, the way we do that is by diverting some of the thrust to uh, the puffer ducts, as we call them. We have puffer ducts in the wingtips, puffer ducts in the tail, and also the nose. And what that does is provide uh, control in all axes uh, whilst it's in the hover. Uh, if you didn't have that, then the aircraft would just fall out of the sky. It'd be on a, a pillar of thrust and you'd not be able to control the, the roll or the pitch or the yaw. By blasting small amounts of thrust out of these puffer ducts, the pilot can balance the plane in hover and can even use them to perform delicate manoeuvres. He can even get it to fly backwards. But if the Harrier is fully loaded with weapons and fuel, it hasn't enough thrust to take off vertically, so it uses a traditional takeoff but with a much shorter run, just 450 metres. When hovering, the Harrier needs constant pilot input. This is particularly true when operating from an aircraft carrier. The thing can't hover and land by itself, so there's lots of things that the pilot needs to do. He's got to be able to manoeuvre the aircraft safely over a, a very small area and be able to land it. So there is a lot of pilot input uh, that you don't get on other aircraft types. This is the, uh, the Harrier cockpit. It's, um, I, I think it's, fa it's fairly basic, but I guess to people looking at it, it seems fairly complicated. Uh, once you know your way around it, it's actually fairly simple. Um, what it has, standard stick for fast jet, and it's designed very much to be a hands-on throttle and stick so you don't take your hands away from that very often. One control that the Harrier has that other fast jets don't have is this control just by my left thigh, which is the, the nozzle control, uh, which is obviously a very fundamental part of how the Harrier flies. Very small um, control, but apart from the stick and the throttle, that's probably the most important control in the aeroplane. Harrier can go anywhere in the world. It can operate from almost any terrain. It's uh, proved itself in desert warfare, uh, temperate climates, um, the Arctic. Uh, it can also operate from the ship. It can land on almost any surface and it can carry uh, a large weapon load. We can compete with, with the very best. Uh, we can go a long way, we can go very high and we can bring precision weapons, which is where warfare is, uh, to the fight. Like the F-15, the Harrier is getting old and by modern standards requires a huge amount of pilot input just to keep the plane in the air when they should be concentrating on the enemy. Also, its inability to go supersonic could put it at a disadvantage when up against faster jets. The solution is the F-35, the joint strike fighter, the only aircraft in the world that is both supersonic and capable of vertical takeoff and landing. The plane is still in development, but its designers firmly believe it represents the future of strike aircraft.
I'm Lieutenant Colonel Art Tomasetti, United States Marine Corps, test pilot for the Joint Strike Fighter Program. In 2001, Lieutenant Colonel Tomasetti achieved a real milestone in aviation history. Flying the prototype JSF, he was the first man to do a short takeoff followed by a supersonic flight, finishing with a vertical landing all in one mission. It showed the versatility of the airplane to be able to have a supersonic capability but still have the capability to land anywhere, take off from just about anywhere, provide you. The JSF achieved this extraordinary feat due to its unique engine system, which is based on the same principles as the Harrier. The engine has a large rear nozzle that can be directed both backwards and downwards. But it also incorporates a new piece of technology that the Harrier doesn't have, a massive fan just behind the pilot, powered by the engine. The lift fan allows a tremendous amount of thrust to be harnessed out of the propulsion system and give the airplane a capability to do its vertical part of its work uh, with a lot more payload than we've ever experienced in airplanes before. The fan is activated when vents open up just behind the pilot. Air is sucked down and pushed out to the bottom of the plane. So together with the rear nozzle, the aircraft is balanced on two pillars of thrust. The rear nozzle, in addition to pointing straight down, can twist in yaw, uh, which allows the airplane to pivot in the sky and perform 360 degree turns. The airplane can fly sideways, the airplane can fly backwards just by vectoring the rear nozzle. And while in hover, the plane is controlled by onboard computers. Unlike previous airplanes, for example in the Harrier, where the pilot has been responsible for controlling the thrust vector and making the inputs uh, required to have the airplane do all those maneuvers, in the JSF airplane, the pilot's just going to ask for go forward, go backwards, turn left, turn right, and the computers now are responsible for wiggling all the parts in the airplane necessary to achieve that maneuver. The use of onboard computers to help fly a plane is now essential in all strike planes and has totally revolutionized the face of air combat. Computers are now used to fly planes that humans couldn't keep in the sky. The first plane to pioneer this use of onboard flight computers was the F-16 Fighting Falcon. In fact, it can't fly without them. The F-16s of 4th Fighter Squadron at Hill Air Force Base near Salt Lake City, Utah, are on standby, ready to deploy to a war zone at a moment's notice. I'm Major Tom Hagen, F-16 pilot with the 4th Fighter Squadron. Major Hagen has been an F-16 pilot for 10 years. Well, the F-16 was originally designed as a low-cost, lightweight fighter, and now it has evolved through many years uh, to a very high-tech weapon system. We drop many different types of air-to-ground ordnance, so it's a very, very dynamic jet. Major Tom Hagen and three other F-16 pilots are going on a bombing training mission. To maintain their state of readiness, they fly at least three times a week. Every mission, even for training, has the potential for accidents or even death. The major danger is the ground. Our number one concern when we're flying low altitude is to not hit the ground. So maintaining our altitude awareness and our uh, situational awareness with respect to terrain and each other is a major issue. F-16s of 4th Squadron are strike bombers designed to take out targets on the ground. Our primary job is dropping bombs, primarily laser-guided bombs. We carry just about all different types of bombs that you might imagine. Two different types of air-to-air -air missiles, rockets for marking uh, targets and whatnot. Uh, so just about every piece of ordnance that you can think about we carry on the jet. The F-16 is an extremely agile plane, something it achieves with a revolutionary design concept. It has an airframe that is designed not to stay in the air. Traditional planes like the F-15 or civilian airliners have stable aerodynamic airframes that will naturally return to level safe flight if left to their own devices. The F-16 uses an entirely different concept built into its design and manufacture. It has an aerodynamically unstable airframe that constantly wants to bank and spin, and that willingness to turn helps the plane to perform complex maneuvers. But of course, the more unstable the design, the less the plane wants to right itself and stay in the air. 
The only solution is to have a powerful onboard computer, constantly correcting the inherent instability by moving the flaps, rudder and aerolongs thousands of times a second in addition to the pilot's inputs. Without the computer, the F-16 would literally fall out of the sky. From the pilot's perspective, it's very stable. From a uh, aeronautics perspective, it's an unstable aircraft. engine, the F-16 is much smaller and lighter than the F-15. Well, it's a big acceleration. Roller coaster rides, whatnot, it's very difficult to uh, imagine that, but it's a big kick when we start running down the runway. The engine has uh, an afterburner on it, so uh, we can select AB thrust, which gives us about 28,000 pounds of thrust. It goes up to speeds of 800 knots and uh, 2.0 Mach, so it's a very fast jet as well. Unlike the F-15, which isn't designed for low maneuvers, the F-16 can operate at any altitude. We uh, work in all altitude regimes from uh, way down at 100 feet all the way up to the high 30s. We can bomb from, from very, very low to very, very high. From the various campaigns that we've seen uh, in the past 20 years, it's an extremely lethal weapon system. Like the F-15 and the Harrier jump jet, the F-16 has been a very successful frontline strike plane, but it too has one great weakness. It can be detected by radar and could be vulnerable to anti-aircraft fire or surface-to-air missiles. The only way to avoid being spotted on radar is to become invisible to become stealthy. The only foolproof way to avoid being shot down while attacking deep behind enemy lines is to make sure no one can see you, to make yourself invisible. On the edge of the White Sands Desert in New Mexico is Holloman Air Force Base, the home of the most radical strike plane ever created, the stealth bomber, the F-117 Nighthawk. A plane so strange that when pilots saw the first one, they thought it was a joke. It may look like an alien spaceship, but the F-117 is the logical step forward from the F-16, a strike bomber that is invisible to radar. I'm Major Trey Urso, and I fly the F-117 Stealth Fighter. Major Urso's job is to constantly evaluate the F-117. The F-117 was designed and built to enable it to fly into the most heavily defended areas on Earth. Its design optimizes its ability to uh, get into those areas without being detected, tracked, and shot by the enemy. The key to its success is its shape, angles and surfaces that do not reflect radar beams. It was designed so that it could penetrate heavily defended airspace and any enemy radar systems that might be looking for that aircraft will either be deflected away or uh, will be absorbed by low observable ram cover. Anytime you've got an edge, you have the potential for a radar to see that edge. So there's some really smart engineering that went into to make sure that those uh, edges are all optimized and as flush as possible to ensure there's no radar cross-section uh, bloom to the enemy radar systems. Any irregular shapes such as fuel tanks or weapons are hidden inside the plane. And because the engines are baffled, the plane is almost silent to anyone on the ground. Well, hopefully by the time the enemy would hear an F-117, the bombs have already gone off and we're well on our way home. To further minimize detection, the F-117 only attacks at night and alone. It's a completely different mindset when you're flying this aircraft. 
Unlike other frontline fighters, we typically employ by ourselves. We will fly into and out of combat zones on an optimized route that will give us the best chance to get into and out of that area without being detected and or engaged by the enemy. Because they attack under the cover of darkness, they use night vision to identify targets. The F-117 utilizes infrared target and tracking systems uh, that basically gives us a TV picture of what's out in front of us. Once we see the general area that we're flying towards, we can then move the aircraft and funnel ourselves towards the target that we're trying to go after. We'll essentially see a black and white picture of the target that we're going after and uh, be able to employ ordnance onto that target by visually identifying it. When the F-117 was originally conceived, the first priority was to make it stealthy. The result was a design that was incredibly unstable. But using the lessons learned from the F-16, the designers were able to get the strange angular airframe to fly using a sophisticated computerized flight control system. The F-117 cannot fly without its computers to help it. It's a fly-by-wire aircraft that without those computers, the aircraft basically doesn't know which way is up and which way is down. When we're in a combat zone and we're focused on getting our weapons onto a target, we're basically on full autopilot and we let the aircraft fly itself into and out of those heavily defended areas. Without computers to keep the plane flying, the lone pilot could easily become overloaded with information and miss the target, or even hit the wrong one. There's no other country in the world that has anything like it. There's no other aircraft flying today that has the capabilities of this aircraft. The F-117 revolutionized the evolution of strike planes. Its successful combat record has demonstrated the effectiveness of stealth in warfare. But even this amazing plane can't do it all. Like the Harrier, it can't go supersonic. And if seen by the naked eye, it is vulnerable to other fighters as it doesn't carry a gun. What was needed was a fast, stealthy strike plane, the FA-22 Raptor. In creating the FA-22, its US designers have gone for broke, building the first ever air-to-air -air fighter with a stealth capability. And it's the first stealthy plane to go supersonic. Hello, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Dave Rose, and I fly the FA-22 Raptor. Lieutenant Colonel Rose is part of a team carrying out flight testing on the FA-22. The F-A-22 Raptor will be the aircraft that goes in there first and uh, not only clears the skies of uh, air threats, but also with the air-to-ground munitions can go in there and basically take out emerging threats. This plane is the culmination of over two decades of design and testing and has incorporated the best features from all the strike planes currently in service. The special thing about the Raptor is we've taken uh, lessons learned from uh, the ages of air combat and we've taken the attributes of what would you like to basically do your job as a fighter pilot and we've put them into one aircraft. Stealth has been around a long time. With the F-A-22, we call it fourth generation. We've taken all that lessons learned to not only be able to, from a shape or applications, to not be seen or to be seen very late by threat radars, but also be able to maintain that. So it's not just go for one mission. I need to be able to maintain that on the ramp for a persistent capability. The F-117 had to be angular to be stealthy, but advances in stealth technology means the F-A-22 Raptor can have familiar curved aerodynamic surfaces and still remain invisible to radar. The Raptor carries powerful electrical detection systems that can scan the airspace up to 1,200 kilometers around it. This ability to spot the enemy from such a large distance, combined with its invisibility, gives the F-A-22 pilot an unbeatable advantage in combat. First thing with the Raptor is they don't see you. I see them, but they don't see me. So now if I need to, I can go ahead and engage them and make them go away. Now I can get into within visual range and with, uh, again, my stealth and capability to maneuver, very quickly I can uh, attrit that threat and leave the area. So I lose a lot less heartbeats. Unlike its predecessor, 
predecessor, the F-117, the Raptor is very fast. It has two staggeringly powerful engines that produce 70,000 pounds of thrust. It also has a secret engine advance called Super Cruise that maintains supersonic speeds without using an afterburner. The Raptor was built to actually maneuver at high altitude, above 50,000 feet, and to be able to go up there and what we call Super Cruise, essentially go supersonic faster than the speed of sound without using the afterburner, so I don't use a lot of fuel. Super Cruise has another advantage in combat. The main thing at night, if I go to afterburner in my F-15 that I've flown for 18 years, I've got this big flame coming out the back, so everybody sees me anywhere from the guy with a gun on the ground to uh, all the surface-to-air missiles. With the capability to go fast, basically without using this big flame out the back, Super Cruise, then I have a lot uh, less susceptibility to the said threats. Like the F-16 and the F-117, the basic design of the F-A-22 is highly unstable and totally dependent on computers to fly. You basically put the stick where you need it and the throttles where you need it and it'll do the rest. It allows you to maneuver the airplane to the extremes and able to ultimately get the job done and still be able to maintain control. The Raptor has one last trick up its sleeve, thrust vectoring. Inspired by the Harrier jump jet, it can direct the thrust from its engines up and down. It can't take off vertically or hover, but it radically improves its air maneuverability. The thrust vector capability of the Raptor gives it an opportunity to make it turn a lot quicker and uh, continue to be able to basically point your nose. Uh, in a regular type of uh, basic fighter maneuver, he who gets his nose uh, in a weapons envelope first wins the fight. So with this actual thrust vectoring capability, we can really turn the airplane and essentially maneuver it twice uh, as better as other airplanes. At an estimated cost of over $120 million each, the F-A-22 is one of the most technologically advanced military planes ever built. It's much more sophisticated and deadly than any enemy plane it is ever likely to come up against. Just knowing you might be up against a Raptor is enough to keep your aircraft on the ground. With the F-A-22 Raptor, we can go down there and kick down the door and make sure as threats emerge, I can take them out. It's a lethal weapon, it's a lethal deterrent. While the US has gone down the route of stealth with the F-A-22, Britain and its European partners have gone for super maneuverability, creating their own advanced strike plane, the Eurofighter Typhoon. It can cruise at supersonic speeds, carry out complex maneuvers at high G-forces, and has the most sophisticated pilot interface ever created. My name is Craig Penrice, I'm the Eurofighter Typhoon project pilot. Craig Penrice is stationed at Preston Air Base, where he has been flight testing the Eurofighter. It's every fighter pilot's dream, uh, and I know that sounds very corny, but it's true. Uh, cockpit that shows you, tells you everything that's happening in the world around you to allow you to be tactical. Thrust and manoeuvrability, carefree handling, all put together make it you know, a wondrous joy, fantastic aeroplane to fly. Many fighters like the F-15 and F-16 have been highly maneuverable, but only at subsonic speeds. What sets the Eurofighter apart is that it can pull off these kinds of moves while flying supersonic. When you aggressively maneuver this airplane, uh, the roll rates that you generate are, are, are quite frankly startling. It, it really feels like you're on the outside of a washing machine being spun around. The, the roll rates will leave your head pinned to one side of the canopy if you're not careful. With airplanes capable of 9G, nine times the force of gravity, this is a fairly tight turn in anybody's language. 9G is sort of currently recognised to be sort of physiologically a limiting factor. The F-15 and F-16 were also capable of pulling 9Gs, but only for short bursts. The Eurofighter is different. It can fly at 9Gs for extended periods. But in order to keep its pilots conscious, they must wear a specially designed Typhoon G-suit. One of the drawbacks of all this agility and all this G is that it does weird things to your body. So through the years we've developed various G protection systems. But with Eurofighter being that much more of a high G airplane, we obviously have to you know, give the pilot the best chance of, of not losing consciousness. So in addition to G trousers, we have uh, inflatable boots in here. We connect the, the, the G-suit trouser uh, connection here into the, into the boot. 
that allows the air to be forced down into bladders that are in the, the boot. They inflate, squeeze my foot and uh, just further increase the coverage of this G protection device. A matching pair. Now zipping up slightly unique going from top to bottom so that the zip doesn't slip down under the forces of gravity, it's already down there, keeping me in there. Uh, flying helmet, uh, providing impact protection, uh, crash helmet, providing uh, communications. We take this aeroplane to places that without this equipment you just simply wouldn't survive. This suit can keep the pilot alert and conscious while pulling 9Gs almost indefinitely. Crucial when going on a mission at 12,000 metres. The Eurofighter is a lethal killing machine and can carry air-to-air -air missiles, air-to-surface missiles and anti-tank bombs. The targeting systems for these weapons appear on a head-up display or inside the pilot's visor so they can aim and fire them without ever having to look down. When you're in a dogfight with somebody, you really don't want to take your eyes off the guy you're fighting because he can do something while you're not looking. So uh, many, many fights have been lost in the past where somebody's looked inside the cockpit to check his height or his speed or his fuel and looked back outside and lo and behold, the bad guy's disappeared. We don't need to do that with our helmet. We can keep our eyes locked onto the bad guy and have in our immediate field of view all the information we need. That's yeah, a huge, huge tactical advantage. Eurofighter's two engines generate a combined thrust of about 40,000 pounds, pushing it to a top speed of 2,125 kilometers an hour, almost twice the speed of sound. When you let the brakes off on the runway with full power, you're accelerating at 30 knots per second. That's about 35, 36 miles per hour every second. So that's zero to 100 in car speak in three seconds. Uh, that's quite frankly uh, stunning. You're pinned to the seat when you're going off. And that also means that you can be at 40,000 feet within a minute of takeoff uh, and only five miles down the road from the, the runway that you took off from. Uh, it's rocket ship uh, territory there, really. This staggering acceleration gets the pilot to the fight fast. Translated into a fighting situation, basically for air to air, the plane that gets the highest, the quickest and fastest is going to have the best uh, first shoot opportunity. So the higher I am and the faster I am, the greater range any given missile will have when it leaves my aeroplane. So I want to get as high and as fast as I can, as quick as I can. That's where uh, excess thrust is always a bonus. Sight is life and speed is groovy. You can't fight what you can't see and you haven't got speed, you aren't going to defeat him either. The Typhoon's afterburners can effortlessly push the plane through the sound barrier. Supersonic's just a number. Nothing happens. The, the controls don't reverse. It doesn't go all blurred. It doesn't shake. It just very smoothly slips through the speed of sound. No more change in sound, no change in feel of the airplane. Uh, but you get there very, very quickly. We can uh, accelerate to, uh, from subsonic to supersonic in, in a heartbeat. Like the FA-22, the Eurofighter can maintain supersonic flight without its afterburners on, using Super Cruise. It not only saves fuel, it also reduces the infrared signature of the plane, making it less susceptible to anti-aircraft fire. The Eurofighter is not stealthy. It has no need to be. It can fly its entire mission supersonically, and it's designed to fight its battles from a distance. No self-respecting fighter pilot in a real engagement wants to get into a dogfight, but it's an area that you must be prepared to go into if needs must. A real fighter pilot wants to be up there, get as high and as fast as he can, shoot first and run away bravely and home for team medals. But there will be situations where a close identity or getting into a dogfight is required. So as well as the performance to get high and fast, you also have to have the ability to manoeuvre in a close-in dogfight. 
Like other modern strike planes, the Eurofighter has an inherently unstable design. It's built with a delta-shaped wing and two small canards on the front, the secret of its incredible maneuverability. To turn 20 tons of unstable metal into an agile fighter requires three computers which control the plane using a revolutionary software system called Carefree Handling. Carefree handling in the airplane simply means that I don't have a care in the world when it comes to manoeuvring my airplane. The flight control computers are constantly looking at what speed height I've got and will limit their response appropriate to the state the airplane's in. So I don't have to worry about exceeding any limit, the airplane will look after me. You simply point the airplane where you want it to go and let go of the stick and it will continue to going there forever and a day. If you put all the things together, such as carefree handling, the thrust of the engines and the performance of the airplane, you take so much of the workload away from the pilot and he simply just has to manoeuvre in relation to the other airplane. You don't have to worry about the limits, you don't have to worry about anything else, you just get on and, and fight the fight. The Eurofighter is the ultimate strike plane, fast, manoeuvrable and deadly. It is the pinnacle of a development process that started with the F-15 some 30 years ago. The F-15 and other contemporary fighters that I've been lucky enough to fly are all very, very good airplanes. Uh, but anybody climbing into this airplane will be able to feel and experience a distinct uh, advantage over any of these contemporary airplanes. Strike planes are the most advanced piloted military aeroplanes ever produced, but they may also be the last. As technology continues to develop with more aerodynamically unstable machines capable of ever greater speeds and maneuverability, there is a problem. It's not computing, airframe design or materials, it's human physiology. The human body simply cannot survive the astonishing g-forces the planes will be able to achieve. It could be that the F-35, Raptor and Eurofighter are the last strike planes ever to be flown by humans. The strike planes of the future may well be pilotless. has changed the world we live in more than any other single machine. From the moment the first locomotive steamed into action, designers have been building trains to go faster and faster. 150 kilometers an hour, 300 kilometers an hour, and now 550 kilometers an hour. When you think of what a train actually does, the loads it carries, the speeds it goes, it's pretty astounding, really. It's a rush. I mean, you get on the train and it accelerates. It's kind of like flying on the ground. We're going nine times the speed of sound, or Mach 9, tomorrow night. And maybe, in the not-too-distant future, the ultimate train will go supersonic. Two, one, zero, fire. High-speed rail is at the forefront of transport technology. Today's machines are the result of over 200 years of innovation and craft. Countries around the world are now locked in a battle of technology to produce the fastest and best railway system on Earth. In 
America more than anywhere else. The unstoppable rise of the automobile and the plane over the last century has beaten the train into near submission. But with gridlocked roads and crowded skies now a daily occurrence, train technology is again making a comeback. In the year 2000, Amtrak unveiled their answer to the 21st century's transport problems. The Acceler Express represents a new dawn for American travel. The Acela is faster than any train America has seen before, travelling at 240 kilometres an hour along a 100-year-old route known as the Northeast Corridor. Inside, the passenger car is smooth and near silent, and the view tells you the speed. But as any train driver will tell you, nothing beats the sensation you get sitting up front. It's a rush. I mean, you get on the train and it accelerates, and you get up to 150 miles an hour, and it's kind of like flying on the ground. To achieve 240 kilometers an hour, the Acela draws over 9,000 kilowatts of power supplied from overhead lines. The locomotive houses an enormous traction motor and is shaped for aerodynamic efficiency and stability. The Acela is very, very technically advanced because of the onboard computer systems that we use to actually operate the train, the computers that the engineer uses to control the speed of the train, the acceleration. When you're driving an Acela, you're at the helm of over 500 tons of steel and over 300 lives. At the Amtrak headquarters in Wilmington, Jay Gilfillan instructs engineers how to drive at 240 kilometers an hour. This simulator replicates every detail and sensation of driving the real Acela. I think the hardest part is that there's so much that you have to do at one time, so many things you have to look at, but it's once you get the feel of it, it's, it's just like driving a car. It becomes second nature to you. The acceleration rate is phenomenal because we actually have two power cars. There's the one that we're in, and then there's one on the other end that's pushing. At some of the speeds that we're going, 150 miles an hour, it will take me almost a mile to get it stopped. Uh, we're going the length of a football field in three quarters of a second. So there's, there's, there's no time for games up here. It's, uh, it's very serious business. The Acela's top speed is limited by the old twisty tracks of the Northeast Corridor. To maintain high speeds on the bends, the Acela carriages are designed to lean into the corners like a row of cyclists. As a result, it can corner 30% faster than other trains along the route. As the car goes into a curve, there's, the car will literally tilt or lean to compensate for the gravitational force of going around the curve. And then when it gets back out on the straight, the computer will say, OK, straighten the car back up. On the power car is a transducer that measures acceleration, deacceleration, the lateral g-forces, and it'll take that information and send it back to the computer on board the coach for the tilting system and tells the computer, okay, I need you to tilt X number of degrees based on how fast we're going and the lateral forces that we're experiencing. Set will make a significant dent in the fortunes of the airlines. From downtown New York to downtown Washington, D.C., the Acela claims to be able to get you to your destination faster than any of its rivals. So we decided to put their claim and their train to the test. Every day, tens of thousands of people make the journey from New York to Washington, D.C. And the best way to get there is a matter of hot debate. Meet Hadley and Sarah. 
Hadley Wasson prefers to make the journey by plane. Sarah Sattel swears by the Acela Express. They're making the same journey from the Empire State Building to the White House, and it's a race to see who gets there first. Let's go. One, two, three. <laughs> Hi, JFK Airport, please. Penn Station, please. Sarah's short journey to Pennsylvania Station in the heart of Manhattan should take minutes. Hadley, on the other hand, has to take a cab to JFK Airport, 27 kilometers from the Empire State, through New York's worst traffic bottlenecks. Once through security and check-in, Hadley's flight will take her direct to Reagan Airport. Sarah will board the Acela, riding the 370 kilometers to downtown DC by train. Then it's a race by taxi to the White House. I prefer flying because taking the train can be more expensive than taking a plane. The time that you save really isn't all that much, and I don't think you even do save any time. The only irritating thing about flying is having to go through security. Hadley's gonna be left in the dust. Sarah's gonna emerge the winner. Oh, I'm gonna win. They're both sure of success, but who will get there first? We're minutes into a race between the airlines and America's new high-speed train. situated in the heart of Manhattan, early indications are good for the train. Hadley is stuck in traffic on her way to the airport and Sarah is already getting settled on the Acela Express. We are less than an hour into the trek down to DC. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'll beat Hadley there because the train's on time. She does only have an hour flight down to DC. Um, she'll have to face traffic though. Uh, Got my seat, relaxed. I can pull out my laptop if I want, chill out, listen to my iPod. Two hours later, and the tables have turned. Despite having to travel further to the airport and having to wait longer for her flight, Hadley gains on Sarah once she's in the air, travelling at 850 kilometres an hour instead of 240 on the ground. As they approach Washington, D.C., Sarah and Hadley are just minutes apart. But with Sarah's train only just arriving at Union Station, Hadley's taxi has already dropped her at the White House. So on this journey, the plane beats the train by just 10 minutes, almost too close to call. But now, a new high-speed train might just tip the balance. As an electrically powered train, the Acela is currently confined to the Northeast Corridor. But now a new model in Canada has borrowed a trick from the airlines. It uses jet age technology to generate enough power to conquer the non-electrified routes in America as well. The jet train. We are able to reach high speed, we are able to reach acceleration comparable to electric train in operation today, but we don't need the electrification that's normally required for those trains. On the outside, the jet train looks exactly like the Acela. It's not until you board the locomotive that you can spot the difference. Engineer Daniel Hubert explains. Essentially, this is exactly the same cab as the Acela power car that's presently in operation on the Northeast Corridor. The only difference uh, would be this uh, small button here. The black switch controls this train's secret. Housed inside a soundproofed compartment, a jet turbine engine. This is the art of the jet train locomotive. It's a, a PW150 derivative that can develop 5,000 HP, which is the equivalent of about a 50 car engine. 
The turbine itself was extracted from a working aircraft and now powers the train by producing electricity to drive the motors. It's so efficient and lightweight that the jet train can match the top speed of the original Acela. It's that combination of high power and low weight that uh, enables us to go at the fastest speeds possible. We've tested it at uh, Pueblo up to 250 kilometers per hour, or 156 miles per hour. We also uh, have the uh, tilting technology that enables to go faster in curves and also provide much better uh, passenger comfort. If it fulfills its potential, the jet train could be running throughout America within five years. Britain is the birthplace of the train and was instrumental in developing many of the world's first high-speed trains, despite having the oldest and possibly twistiest network in the world. The Silver Jubilee drawn by the streamlined Silver Link left King's Cross. She is to run regularly between London and Newcastle, and on her trial trip, she attained a record speed of 112 miles an hour. Speed, comfort, and a wild modern beauty. Thanks to its rich rail history, there are some 100,000 train spotters in the UK. They are all fiercely proud of their railway heritage. And this man is no exception. I was never actually a train spotter, although I do, you know, I do like, uh, I do like big lumps of technology, and a train is actually a big lump of technology. Bruce Dickinson is a train enthusiast with a passion for high-speed rail travel. He rides the world's high-speed trains whenever his job permits. Bruce is rock band Iron Maiden's lead singer. We're going to do a song now. We want to dedicate it to everybody. Despite fame, fortune and cult status, he still finds time to indulge his very British passion. His all-time favourite is the Intercity 125, a model of reliability and speed. Well, I have to say, I mean, I have a big old soft spot for the relatively, you know, obsolete now, bless it, but the old high-speed train, you know, because it was one of the very first high-speed trains, and it was also, it, it was an independent power source, you know, it wasn't dependent on, uh, you know, um, electrical power and pantographs and things like that, and it rocked along at a fair old lick. But Britain's high-speed trains have always been limited by the age of the network, unable to reach the highest speeds on their twisty Victorian tracks. To overcome the problem, British Rail launched the Advanced Passenger Train, the APT. The world's first tilting train, it was a huge success when it was introduced in 1979, breaking the UK speed record at 261 kilometres an hour. But the APT was withdrawn from service a few months later, thanks to bad publicity after the tilt mechanism stuck with journalists on board. Over two decades later, and tilting technology is back on track in Britain. The Pendolino, developed by Fiat, tilts up to 8 degrees and maintains an average speed of 240 kilometres an hour. Like the Acela, its advanced computerised systems switch off the tilt at critical moments en route to prevent the train from colliding with tunnels, bridges and other trains. The Brits have always had a, a love-hate relationship with, with technology. We love inventing it, but we hate exploiting it. And uh, you know, you can almost look at the, the movie The Italian Job and say, well, unfortunately, they've, they've tucked us up good and proper now because they're actually selling back our technology back to us in the form of the Pendolino, which Virgin has brought, you know, because of our higgledy-piggledy twisty tracks. We're stuck with Italian technology, not a bad thing necessarily, but just a great shame because the APT was potentially a fantastic bit of kit. As 
As new high-speed trains like the Acela and the Pendolino get faster, so designers have to develop better braking systems and more effective impact strategies. Today's systems use complex computer networks to keep the trains on course and several kilometres apart. But sometimes the only way to advance the technology is to test it to destruction. Crashing trains is a crucial part of assessing how the structure of the carriages react under the forces of impact. Thanks to tests like these, train designers now know, for example, that there is a far greater chance of neck and spine injuries in forward-facing seats. When Amtrak designed the Acela, they weren't only concerned with how fast can we go. Their primary concern was the safety of the passengers and the safety of the engineers. The cab of the locomotive is designed in such a way that there's actually a built-in refuge area that in the event of a collision that the engineer could go to for his safety and the locomotive would basically crumble around him. There's crumple zones designed into the cars. There are energy absorbing devices Part of the knuckle is a hydraulic energy absorbing device. There are buffer plates between each car to absorb the impact. I don't want to say it, but it's designed to withstand an accident. The American trains are, are built primarily out of steel, where the European trains, I believe, are a lot of aluminum type metals, which are a lot lighter, and they're able to go faster, but they won't withstand an accident as well as it's kind of like if you're driving around in a tank at a Volkswagen and you run into a telephone pole, I'd prefer to be in a tank. When trains crash for real, it's easy to understand why designers put so much effort into protecting passengers. But it's not always the train that's to blame. If the track breaks or cracks, there is little that can be done to stop a train derailing. In October 2000 at Hatfield near London, a technical failure caused a high-speed accident on an intercity 225. It would have lasting repercussions for Britain's railways. Bev Adshead had recently started a new job as a buffet attendant on the train. You read about these things, they don't happen to you, they happen to somebody else. And suddenly, these things happen to me. 12.10 p.m. on October the 17th. As the train rounded the bend at 185 kilometres an hour, a rail under the carriage is cracked. The train derailed, overturning as it ploughed into the ballast. I just sort of grabbed hold of this doorway, hoping that I wouldn't slide back into the window and just really hoping that train had either stop or that I'd just go unconscious so I didn't know anything else. The buffet car was thrown into the air before coming to rest in the undergrowth 15 seconds later. We actually climbed out of the roof, so half of that carriage, the roof was literally ripped off. It would highlight a major problem for high-speed trains everywhere, that heavier, powerful locomotives cause more wear and tear on the track. As a result of the Hatfield tragedy, the entire rail network in Britain is being overhauled and improved. And the rail companies are determined to develop new technologies that will make their tracks safer. In Britain, independent inventor Malcolm Higgins is developing a machine that will help combat rail fatigue by cleaning rails without damaging them. I didn't know anything about lasers. I didn't know anything about trains. I'm not an engineer, so I seemed well qualified to take this idea forward. High-tech mobile maintenance is the key to keeping high-speed trains on track. 
Currently, the biggest problem rail operators face is keeping rails free from damaging leaf residue. You can see here a fairly typical example of dirty rail. The black area here gives some idea of what leaf residue looks like. Vortices along the side of the train pick up the leaves and actually force them in between the wheel and the rail. Repeated rollings of the wheels uh, actually roll them into this Teflon-like coating on the surface. Then when you get water on it as well, it uh, becomes like a skid pan. Delays caused by leaves on the line have become a national joke in Britain, but in reality they occur in every country and can make trains skid through red signals. Currently, rail companies use high-pressure jets of water and sandite, a kind of abrasive gel, to try to combat the problem. But this method is not 100% efficient and comes with its own set of problems. Leaving behind tough grains of sand only increases the chance of track fatigue and the potential for damaged rails. Malcolm's invention will revolutionise the whole approach to rail maintenance. For four years, his team have been experimenting with laser light as a means of stripping leaf residue from the rail. Soon, it will be tested out on the real rail network. First of all, we have the laser itself. This laser is just a prototype version at the moment. Effectively, we will be producing power that's ten times more than this type of lasers produced before in the world, which is an awful lot of energy to have to control. All of this is delivered through fibre optic cable, which uh, routes its way down through the container to the railhead, uh, and that's where the business end is. Here we have the fibre optic coming down into something called an optical box. We have here 25,000 pulses of light a second being delivered onto the track. We're keeping the light contained by this bottom shoe that protects us all and makes sure that the light that we're using uh, doesn't cause any damage to our eyes or indeed to any little furry animals that might be by the side of the track or anything like that. Each little pulse of energy that we deliver uh, is 5,000 degrees centigrade but all of that energy is absorbed by the contamination that's on the railhead. So if you put your hand on straight afterwards uh, you wouldn't feel any heat in the process at all. Malcolm's invention could be fully operational within two years. But there is one foolproof way to avoid problems with high-speed corners and faulty rails altogether. Completely rebuild the network. The world's fastest trains are designed to run on purpose-built, straight track and have broken records in the process. The fastest railways in the world have tracks built specifically for them. Exclusive, dedicated tracks, free from sharp bends, incur less wear and tear and make the system much safer too. The Japanese really came up with the concept of a dedicated track and a dedicated trains that just went that went very fast. It really was a revolutionary concept. It was market driven by the numbers of people that simply want to move from A to B to C to D all in a straight line. That makes it a doddle to design a train to do that. For over 30 years, the Shinkansen bullet has been rocketing between Tokyo and Osaka at 257 kilometres an hour, until recently quicker than any other train system on Earth. For train designers planet-wide, the bullet has proved itself as the icon of high-speed train travel. Like the bullet, the French TGV system relies on fast trains running on specially built straight tracks. These trains don't need to tilt as the system has done away with sharp corners completely. The TGV, or Train à Grande Vitesse, is the modern champion of speed, regularly topping 274 kilometres an hour. During tests in 1990, an experimental TGV hit a staggering 515 kilometres an hour, setting a new world record. <laughs> Sortez le champagne <laughs>
The TGV's secret of success is in its engineering. There are half the number of wheel assemblies known as bogies, giving the carriages an ultra-low centre of gravity and vastly reducing the overall weight and friction of the train. The TGV is also possibly the safest train system in the world. The positioning of the bogies reduces sideways forces on the carriages, making derailing much less likely. Part of the reason that it has never been involved in a fatal accident. It's truly a source of envy for France's neighbours. We somehow got caught up in all the red tape and were unable to do something as simple as the French, which is put one pantograph on the front of the engine and run a cable down the train and power the back car. And that simple piece of technology enabled the TGV to get up and going and they could just clamp multiple units together and run huge trains throughout the length of the network. In the not too distant future, French technology is set to revolutionise rail travel for one of its neighbours. Currently, a fleet of 27 multi-million dollar Eurostar trains connect France and the UK through the Channel Tunnel rail link. An adaptation of the TGV, the Eurostar locomotives generate power equivalent to 130 car engines as the train hurtles towards the French side of the tunnel at 300 kilometres an hour. Now, new Eurostar track is being laid between the Channel Tunnel and London to bring trains on the English side up to speed. A massive civil engineering enterprise that has involved uprooting whole villages. When the new link opens, trains will travel at 300 kilometres an hour for the first time in Britain. And a journey from the heart of Paris to the centre of London will take just over two and a half hours, shaving 20 minutes off the current time. High-speed train systems that run on dedicated track are so reliable that accidents are extremely uncommon. But at these kinds of speeds, one tiny flaw can lead to catastrophe. The Intercity Express is Germany's answer to the TGV. It uses lightweight alloys, tilts like the Pendolino and has a top speed of 280 kilometres an hour. When the ICE derailed in 1999, it became the worst German rail disaster in 20 years. Travelling at 200 kilometres an hour, the fourth carriage derailed, sending the rest of the train ploughing into a bridge. 102 people died. What nobody had accounted for was an unexpected fault in a new type of wheel called the Bochum 84. It was a tragic end to the ICE's 100% record for safety. The ICE accident highlighted a problem that all railways face, that mechanical parts can fail without warning. If you want to go even faster and remain safe, modern thinking suggests you have to do away with rails and wheels altogether. In Japan, this experimental train with wings works on the same principle as a piece of paper dropping to the floor. It's kept afloat by a cushion of air. The aero train has no brakes. It has to use a parachute to stop. Even more ingenious, researchers are developing trains known as maglevs that also skim above their tracks, this time suspended on a cushion of magnetism. In 1999, an experimental maglev in Japan sped to 552 kilometers an hour breaking the passenger train world record previously held by the TGV. Magnetic levitation was first developed in the 1960s by British inventor Professor Eric Lathwaite. This is a linear motive. 
and that's just a fancy name for a row of electromagnets. This is a sheet of aluminium. When I put it on the motor and switch on the magnets, something pretty dramatic occurs. I try and put it back now. You see, I can hold it with finger and thumb because it tries to float, but it isn't stable sideways. If I get it a bit off-center, it tends to fly off. Let it go, and there you have propulsion without physical contact. Like Lathwaite's linear motor, the maglev track contains a row of powerful electromagnets that create enough upward force on magnets in the train to lift it into the air. And that when switched on in rapid succession, provide enough horizontal force to propel it forward. To brake, the magnetic field is simply reversed and magnetic forces act on the train in the opposite direction. Today, a prototype in Emsland, Germany, carries passengers around a 30 kilometer test track at super high speeds. Maglevs don't need to tilt. The track is already steeply banked to 12 degrees to accommodate high speed bends. There is no motor on the train, it's in the track, making the maglev far lighter than normal trains, and even though it consumes a third less power, its acceleration is four times better than the TGVs. And with no wheels touching the track, friction is minimal. There is no danger of rail fatigue or wheel failure, and the train can reach astonishing speeds. People often ask, uh, what is the maximum speed possible for a maglev train? Today, it would be possible to, to maintain uh, higher speeds of about 600, 700 kilometers per hour. Germany is famous in the world for engineering capacities, but I think even in other countries, uh, it would have been possible to build up or develop a system like this. Maglev technology already has truly international appeal. The German design is on a fast track to China. The world's first commercial maglev between Shanghai and its airport opens in 2004, reducing the journey time from 45 to 8 minutes. The system is expected to carry 10 million passengers, rising to a predicted 20 million by 2010. If it proves a success, China plans to build a massive intercity network of 435 kilometer an hour maglev trains to ease the burden on its overcrowded transport system. For the future of maglev technology, the sky is quite literally the limit. In America, scientists at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center are developing a maglev train that could propel their spacecraft skywards. Heading the team is Dr. Ken House. Okay, come on down. Back in the late 90s, NASA uh, sent out a research announcement to uh, invite uh, bids and proposals from uh, scientists who had ideas on ways to build a track that would utilize the forces of electricity and magnetism to provide an initial velocity, uh, a little bit of a boost, you know, give us some launch assist. One of the advantages of looking at the uh, electric motor uh, maglev concept is the fact that all of the energy required for the initial start from zero velocity up to the 400 mile an hour is provided on the ground. There's no friction, there's no wheels, and there's no heat and power loss that's associated with friction and, and rolling uh, elements like bearings and wheels. With the uh, opening of the recent maglev train, it's been demonstrated and proving that the technology is, is there. It's possible and it's feasible to move large heavy objects at fairly high speeds using simply electricity and the force of magnets, magnetism. The launch system is a fusion of two technologies, using the train and the plane to achieve a common goal. 
the train won't be going all the way to space. Instead, it will remain bound to its track as a flying vehicle is catapulted skywards. This is the uh, starting point or the end, end of the motor. And uh, in this section would be the levitation and in the center section would be the linear motor. This bed here provides the levitation force or the uplifting against gravity. These sets of coils here provide a stabilizing effect in the side-to-side -side direction. Although NASA's models aren't yet ready to fly, they have proved that maglev trains could one day accelerate spaceships to over one and a half thousand kilometers an hour. Running through a tunnel of less dense gas like helium, friction from the air is reduced and the space train would have enough acceleration to launch its payload into orbit. <laughs> But just how fast can the ultimate train go? The answer may be here at the Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. If any train deserves the prefix of ultimate, this has to be it. The Air Force's hypersonic upgrade program, or HUP, has taken over five years and $20 million to perfect. This is potentially the fastest railed machine on the surface of our planet. This is the Holloman High Speed Test Track. It's the most uh, precisely aligned uh, piece of rail in the world. Anywhere along it, it's uh, 11 thousandths of an inch in terms of alignment, both laterally and vertically. This track is the longest in the world, the fastest in the world, the most highly instrumented in the world. The sled run that we're getting ready to do tomorrow will fire a narrow gauge sled down this that goes 9,600 feet per second or about 6,500 miles per hour. It will uh, set a new world land speed record for a railed vehicle. We're going nine times the speed of sound or Mach 9 tomorrow night. At Holloman high speed test track, speed records have regularly tumbled. The last record breaker back in 1982 smashed through Mach 8 eight times the speed of sound, reaching over 9,800 kilometers an hour. of military high-speed research programs, from testing ejector seat systems to observing missile ballistics. These are ground-based tests that pave the way for flying prototypes. Most of these trains ran with little more than a mannequin at the helm, but it wasn't always the case. In the 1950s, human guinea pig Colonel John Stapp was regularly accelerated through 40 Gs, suffering broken bones and retinal hemorrhaging in one of the tests. The HUP train is designed to deliver a warhead into its target at the highest possible speed. This train is too brutal for our railways, but the test will provide engineers with valuable hypersonic data. Mission HUP-80X G1 is hours away from launching into history. Dave Minto heads the team. It'll be very exciting, but it will also be very nervous because we're doing something that's never been done before. Uh, we'll be venturing into the unknown. New things can happen in physics when you go to where you haven't been. We've done an extensive amount of modeling and simulation to try to make sure that we know exactly what's going to happen. But modeling and simulation is only as good as the physics we know. 
Uh, so there is an element of the unknown. Essentially a missile on rails, the HUP train is kept inside a protective tent until moments before the run. All right, well this is the first stage of our sled train. Uh, it's got five uh, Pupfish rocket motors, which is the first stage of the multiple launch rocket system. Burns for about uh, 1.5 seconds. Uh, then we'll light up a second stage. The second stage has six of the same rocket motor, the multiple launch rocket system first stage. The third stage rocket motor is a new rocket motor that we've had developed. We call it the Super Roadrunner rocket motor. It produces 228,000 pounds of thrust, burns for about 1.4 seconds. That'll get us up to about 4,000 feet a second. And then we'll light up a fourth stage, which is the same rocket motor again, 228,000 pounds of thrust. Now that'll get us up to 9,600 feet per second or about 6,500 miles per hour. This train is designed to cover its single four and a half kilometer journey in a mere six seconds. Like a multi-stage space rocket, each section fires and then breaks away, accelerating the payload to a speed that's over four times faster than Concorde. But this train won't be stopping at a platform. It'll be slamming into its destination at full speed. At the end, we'll deliver this uh, payload, which is uh, on top of the fourth stage here, uh, into a target at, uh, at a velocity that's, uh, of course, 9,600 feet per second, which will have about as much energy as if a car ran into a uh, brick wall at 2,000 miles an hour. Instead of wheels, which would tear apart, the train uses reinforced steel slippers that literally slide along the track. Like NASA's maglev, to reach the highest possible speeds, the HUP will run through an atmosphere of helium. Russ Kurtz explains. We've got this uh, helium tube, we call it, which is basically uh, four mil plastic that we create around the track and we fill with helium. And helium, as you know, is one-seventh the density of air. It cuts down a great deal on the drag and it enables us to reach these higher speeds. As they learned in previous tests, moving through ordinary air at Mach 9 produces shockwaves so intense that steel can melt. In this case, as this uh, slipper was going down the track, what happened is you had shocks coming off the sides here, or shock waves, and impinging on this canard. And, and you can kind of see the melt. If you look really closely, that is a melted surface. It's more like a, a blowtorch came in here and started cutting this off. From a safe vantage point one mile away, the world's media wait patiently for word that all systems are go and the fastest train on Earth can launch. Seconds before the sonic boom reaches the observers. Footage from the high-speed cameras shows the helium tube shattering as the train speeds through it. And still shots reveal hypersonic shock waves trailing in its wake. The snapshots also show the payload lifting off before it hits the target. The impact itself is so secret that the footage hasn't been released. 
clocked at 10,430 kilometres an hour. It's a new world record. At these speeds, this train would, in theory, take just two minutes to travel from New York to Washington, D.C. And just over 25 minutes to cross America. Like the jet, high-speed rail is now capable of supersonic speeds. Soon, it could surpass it as the ultimate way to travel. Remember to remain seated upright with your seatbelt tightly fastened at all times. These people are about to experience the tallest and fastest thrill ride in the world. Head back and hold on. They're going to be blasted up 128 metres at 190 kilometres per hour in just eight seconds. Very scared. <laughs> Gotta hold on tight here. Keep arms down, head back. We're about to go! Here we go! Yeah, oh my God. yeah baby! 420 feet to the top! 420 feet! Over the top! Coming down! to do two things. We wanted to build the fastest ride, fastest thrill ride anywhere in the world and break the 100 mile an hour barrier 
and we wanted to be the tallest thrill ride in the world, and we did that when we came out at 415 feet. The incredible momentum created by the launch carries the train up the 127 meter tower, higher than a 41 story building. If you wanted to have a traditional roller coaster with a normal lift that you're used to seeing, in order to get a 415 foot height, your lift would have to be in excess of 800 feet long. And when you take into account that a chain is going to have to go up that lift and down that lift and, and the other configurations it's going to need, the weight of the chain alone is going to require motors and gearboxes and, and arrangements that would just make it practically impossible to use conventional chain to do. To get round these problems, Superman's designers chose a revolutionary propulsion system, linear synchronous motors. These electromagnetic motors were developed to launch missiles as part of the Star Wars defense system. The linear synchronous motor challenge was a tremendous challenge, actually. It had never been used in any commercial application at all. Uh, there had been some uh, work in a military application for linear synchronous motors. So when we brought it in and started to apply it, we had a, a lot of obstacles to overcome. The secret behind linear synchronous motors is magnetism. Magnets on the track repel opposing magnets on the bottom of the train, lifting it up. So the train floats on a frictionless magnetic field. To create forward momentum, computers control the polarity of the magnets in the track so that they alternately attract and repel the magnets in the train. This rapid attraction and repulsion means Superman's motors both push and pull the train forwards. This system is so effective it can accelerate the train to 174 kilometers an hour in just seven seconds. We're pulling the car through the front of the magnet and pushing the car out the back of the magnet. That requires a tremendous amount of processor speed and the ability to switch large amounts of electricity in order to make that electromagnet do it. Uh, coming up with a computer network that was reliable enough and quick enough to make that switch gear move that power in the motors was the challenge that we had. Go! Superman riders experience the sensation of being pinned to their seat, followed by the feeling of weightlessness. These sensations are what provide the thrill in thrill rides, and what creates them are G-forces. A few G-forces can be exhilarating, but the human body can only endure so much before we pass out. And in extreme circumstances, G-forces can even be killed. Human beings all live daily with G-force. The force of one G is the force of the Earth's gravitational pull that a person feels when they're at rest on the Earth's surface. In other words, a person would feel their normal weight. However, when an individual experiences higher than one G, they feel heavier, equivalent to the number of Gs. At three Gs, they would feel three times as heavy. When a person feels weightless, they're experiencing zero G. Tim Burkhart explains. 
When a rider rides Superman, there's uh, obviously two prominent G-forces that they're going to experience, the positive Gs and negative Gs. The positive Gs really are what you feel during that tremendous boost of acceleration. You're just being pushed back into the seat, and you get that feeling of uh, rocket launch or, uh, or being launched off an aircraft carrier or riding in a race car. It's, it's just a great feeling being pushed back into the seat. And then conversely, when you're coming down the drop, those forces work the opposite direction and are negative forces that create the weightless feeling. And again, on Superman, you get almost three seconds of weightlessness. And virtually every roller coaster built has some degree of weightlessness to it, but it's typically measured in tenths of a second. On Superman, you're going to experience for about three seconds. This weightless feeling creates the bottom out of the seat experience what thrill riders call airtime. Watch the breast pop into the man in the middle of the car. At the moment of zero G, he stops with the train because he's held in his seat. However, his sunglasses, which are not strapped in, continue to travel in a straight line upwards. If the man was not restrained, he would join his sunglasses. Research on test pilots has shown that humans can only tolerate small amounts of negative G because, while accelerating downwards, the liquid part of your body, blood, lags behind the solid parts, bones and organs. Too much negative G will cause a rush of blood to the brain and the pilot will literally see red and then collapse in what is called a red out. a more positive G than negative, but even so, designers have to work within the limits. If a healthy person is subjected to too much positive G, they will start to lose their vision at around 6G, and at 9G, blood will flow from the brain and they will black out. At 14G, they will die. All thrill ride designers manipulate positive and negative g-forces, but what are they really trying to achieve when they create an ultimate ride? One of the theme park industry's most admired visionaries started his career in cinema, making special effects for James Bond films. Today, he is one of the most successful thrill ride designers in the world. Enthusiasts believe that John Wardley has been responsible for many of the greatest rides ever made. When I create a ride, my ultimate goal is the end result, to give people a thrilling, exciting, amazing experience. And that experience is something that we determine in the brief for the design of the ride. So we might be wanting to give people a scary experience or an intimidating one. We might want to enchant them, to baffle them. All these emotions are the emotions that other forms of entertainment manipulate, whether you're in the theater or the film industry or us in the theme park industry, we are doing the same thing. We're playing with people's emotions and giving people an entertaining time. To manipulate our emotions and give us the thrills we crave, thrill ride designers use the laws of physics. This ride, Enterprise, is a classic example. It was created in the 1970s and it still inspires designers today. I'm about to be spun round in a circle vertically upside down, 25 meters in the air, and yet there is nothing going to be holding me in my seat. There are no seat belts, no lap bars, no over-the-shoulder restraints, nothing is going to hold me in when I am upside down on this wheel, 25 meters in the air. Well, what on earth is it that's holding me in? Well, some of you might say centrifugal force. Well, the physicists don't like people talking about centrifugal force. They talk about centripetal force. But what is this force? Well, it's very simple, really, when you understand. Basically, anybody in motion wants to go in a dead straight line unless some force tries to nudge it off course. 
So when you throw an object, that object wants to go in a perfect straight line, but gravity pulls you back down to Earth. So when I'm on this wheel, spinning around as I am, I don't really want to go around in a circle at all. I want to be projected in a dead straight line, yet the seat that I'm sitting on is constantly nudging me around in a circle towards the centre in order to make me spin around. And the force that that seat is applying to me is what we call centripetal force. So it, it's dead easy when you think about it, and it's also great fun. While Enterprise uses centripetal force to hold you in your seat, the latest generation of thrill rides uses the same force to give you the sensation of being thrown out of it. SkySWAT opened in 2003 and creates a unique pulled out of your seat experience. <laughs> Sky Swat's creator wanted to give riders a new kind of thrill. A lot of people like to go up the hill on the roller coaster and then go towards the ground. But then when they get to the ground, they go this way. I want to be able to let them dive towards the ground and then look like they're going to for sure hit the ground and swing underneath. And that was the whole concept there. Sky Swat is the first of its kind in the world. Astro World director Ken Moulsby supervised its construction. They have a piston that pulls the cables tight and lifts us up. So it's a very smooth, computer-controlled process. The computer is monitoring all the time the air pressure in these cylinders. And so what it does is, is as we're rising up here, it's monitoring constantly how fast the boom is rising and how much air it needs to add to make us come smoothly up to the top. When we get to the top here, there are locking pins, and those lock the trolleys that carries the pivot in, and you can feel us settle into place at the top. Now we're hooked up to the main power that will rotate. We have some locking pins that are going to go in place, and we begin to rotate. And depending which side of the ride you're on, you may start backward and you may start forward. But this is really a nice ride because you feel yourself being pulled out of the seat. That's what produces, I think, a lot of the screen. Just being pulled out of your seat the whole time. And it's really a terrific ride to ride on the day when you, you know, it's warm outside, which it is a lot in Houston, because you can just feel the wind rushing by as you go. The end of this boom travels at peak speed about 30 miles per hour. So it's really kind of a nice feeling to get the wind rushing. And I like this over the top, and you can look down and just see the ground and the concrete coming at you. And uh, it really is a very good, over-the-top feeling to just be going completely upside down while it goes. And, uh, you know, being a technical guy, I like to be able to feel the motors pushing and pushing and doing their thing. You can feel a little bit of that as they go through. Without state-of-the-art restraints, Kent and the other Sky Swatch riders would be flung to a certain death. Kent explains some of Sky Swatch's vital technology. The restraints on this ride are designed to hold you in while you go upside down. This one rock, locks twice at the pivot point. And this one pulls down and locks on my shoulder, so I have two different restraints. Then it telescopes here to lock it in. The seat confines me enough to where this still will retain me in the seat no matter what happens. But there is a design trade-off between safety and excitement, and this has always concerned Stan Chekets. 
the greater challenge there is to put a restraint on that that doesn't enclose you so terribly much that the experience is lost. See, it's all relative. In other words, I, we could build a restraint as all a bunch of foam and cover you completely up and hold your head, nice big foam stuff, but then you've lost the experience. And I've said for years and years, we need to get the restraint smaller and smaller so that your exposure is greater because that's what pumps up our adrenaline. SkySwat's restraint system will hold in comfort a vast range of people, from a seven-year-old girl to a 108-kilogram rugby player, yet still let them enjoy an adrenaline-pumping thrill. On this ride, the restraints have a different but equally important role. They create the illusion of being able to fly. This engineering breakthrough was developed for a radical new British ride called Air. It's the first ride in the world where you fly like a bird, and it uses the ultimate in harness technology. When riders embark on air, they pull down a restraint which has twin locks and is computer controlled. Underneath is a remarkable flexible jacket made from neoprene, a synthetic rubber that automatically moulds to the rider's shape so that everyone feels comfortable and is completely safe. Even when the floor falls away and you are tipped face down. Air is another design triumph for John Wardley. His aim is to give the rider the unique sensation of smooth flight. And I am now extremely secure and, to be honest, very comfortable indeed. And it's a good job because in a minute I am going to be taken about uh, 30 metres in the air and then drop down a great drop, tumbled over on my back, spun around as if I'm flying. And you really do feel as if you're about to fly. I don't need to uh, hold on with my arms. Here we go, down the first drop, and you're like a bird. You're flying through the air. This is like no other roller coaster. Wow. But now I'm rolling over on my back. It's an amazing sensation. And turning back over onto my front and diving down underground, down from the tunnel, up around, over the heads of everybody below me. Another barrel roll. But you feel as if you are flying where you would want to go if you were a bird. I'm not being wrenched in directions that my body doesn't want to take me. It is so incredibly smooth and the most beautiful sensation of flight. So there you have it, air, the world's first real flying roller coaster. It just gives you a really good head rush. When you first like go down, it feels like you're gonna fall out because it's just drop that. It was really scary, as so, though like if anything went wrong, you could actually fall out. Well-designed seats can enhance the ride, but never before have they provided the main buzz. The designers of this ride have given the thrill ride laws of physics a new twist. They have pushed the accepted boundaries of human endurance further than ever before. In 2002, a revolutionary new ride called X was unveiled. It not only twists riders, but spins them on all three axes, vertically, horizontally and diagonally. This is made possible by radical technological advances in its unique seating system. Very first time, thrill seekers ride in vehicles that can spin independently 360 degrees. This generates an unprecedented level of unpredictability, as the passengers have no idea what is going to happen next. 
exit was inspired by wanting to do things that you weren't really allowed to do with the traditional roller coaster because you were limited to following the rails. But with X, what we're able to do now is rotate those guests to positions that they can handle the acceleration levels more comfortably. It also allowed us to put the guests in positions that tended to be a little more thrilling or scary. They were able to see things that they weren't able to see before because we could rotate them in positions that they could see the ground where they normally couldn't see the ground because the floorboard was in the way. Or they could do a flip or something like that as they're moving along a relatively smooth section of track. And so it opened up a lot more design flexibility by using the X system. On X, riders have perched on the edge of a massive six meter wide train and then plummeted 60 meters to the ground head first. Next, they race at 120 kilometers an hour, spinning head over heels while performing forward and backward acrobatics. Unlike traditional coasters, this ride has four rails. Two are for the train to travel along, and the other two, in the centre of the track, coloured yellow, control the spin of the chairs. Located along the yellow rails is a system of wheels and gears which enable the seated rider to be rotated while hurtling along the track. This ingenious technology allows the passengers to experience even more thrills and g-force than ever before. X takes its riders to the very limit of their endurance. Using sophisticated computer graphics, the X ride designers were able to pinpoint the precise g-forces at any stage of the ride. software allowed them to program moves that would rotate a rider out of danger if the computer predicted that the g-force limit was about to be breached. When you're designing a roller coaster you don't want to throw people out of their seat because that's uncomfortable and it also throws them into the restraints which they pushes onto their shoulders or onto their lap bar depending on the restraint system. And so if you can orient the guest relative to those accelerations so that you're pushing down into the seat or into the back of the seat then it makes it more comfortable for them and they can handle higher acceleration levels than they could if it was in a different direction. X has won numerous awards for its remarkable engineering and many enthusiasts believe that it is the best thrill ride ever constructed. But some crave a more primeval thrill. Some thrill rides are designed to trigger a cocktail of different sensations, others are custom made to achieve a specific psychological effect. With Oblivion, the technology is geared to intimidate you. Oblivion is the first drop roller coaster in the world. While queuing, passengers are told that they could die. Riding Oblivion rates higher on the terror scale than any other ride. The six-ton train climbs very slowly up a vertical rail. It then edges towards a ledge where the track apparently hangs unsupported in mid-air. As the train slips over the edge, it dangles over a 55-metre drop for what seems like an eternity. The riders then hurtle towards the black hole in the ground far below. As they enter the void, they're sprayed with a mist which momentarily conceals the route underground. But before they can comprehend what is going on, Oblivion then spins them in a dark pit for maximum disorientation. challenge for 
leading designer John Wardley was to make each moment before the drop as terrifying as possible. Now, purely for psychological effects, we hold you at the top of the drop for about three seconds to build up the adrenaline before you drop. Now, of course, with a normal roller coaster, you couldn't do this because as soon as you leave the top of the chain lift, you're actually rolling under gravity. So your, your movement from the top of the chain lift is actually controlled by a series of quite complicated conveyors. Uh, one of them being a vertical chain conveyor that's the reverse of, of the lift that we're climbing at the moment. So that you are engaging on a chain and that chain then holds you at the top of the precipice for three seconds. For most people it feels like 33 seconds, it feels like an eternity. But you're just held there for three seconds and then a clutch releases and the chain allows you to drop. From that moment on you really are free running. So we're now engaging on that chain conveyor now. It's now stopping, pausing, the clutch is going to release and away we go. Oblivion plunges 55 metres in just 2.2 seconds. But even this is not enough for some sensation seekers. For years, adrenaline junkies have pitted themselves against one of the ultimate forces of nature, Niagara Falls, by going over them in a barrel. Most have not lived to tell the tale, but if you can't face going over Niagara Falls, then try the perilous plunge. It's only a few metres shorter and you can experience the thrill of going over a waterfall without dying. This is the tallest water ride in the world. It plunges you 36 metres at a near vertical 78 degrees. Oh, and you do get wet. The magnetic brakes and 75 and a half thousand litres of water seem to that. Not Berry Farm's chief engineer, Mark Schuler, explains how the world's tallest and steepest water drop ride relies on magnets. Uh, the boat you're in uh, weighs approximately 14,000 pounds empty. It's fitted with permanent magnets on the bottom of the boat, uh, which we'll be using when we get to the bottom of the drop to help slow us down. Uh, that and the uh, large volume of water uh, down there bring the boat to a nice smooth slowdown. And we're just crowning the top of the lift at 125 feet. Nice view of the area. We go around the turn and uh, get prepared to go on down the drop. Now this drop's 78 degrees, and we're gonna join 20,000 gallons of water here, so it's gonna get wet. And that's a bit of water. Uh, just got to experience the, uh, the effects of magnetic braking and a little bit of water to help slow us down to this nice stop. If Perilous Plunge relied on water alone to stop the boat, it would need three times the distance. Drop rides are now a must-have thrill in any modern theme park. But 10 years ago, this type of tower ride didn't exist. This is Power Tower. When it opened in 1998, it was the tallest tower ride in the world and pioneered the new thrill ride technology of pneumatics, using compressed air in some of the largest cylinders ever made. Riders are blasted downwards at a force greater than gravity. A negative G rush of blood to the head is guaranteed with this ride. That's one of the most unbelievable rides I've ever ridden in my life. I flew up out of my seat. I love it. She's still well, look at it. She's still crying. Still shaking. It's awesome. To get up there, you're able to look over everything, but it happens very quickly. The drop was probably the best part of it. 
Big pants are probably not a good thing though. You get anxious, nervous, scared, excited, and then it's over. <laughs> Power Tower riders have a choice. As well as being blasted down, they can be shot skywards. Power Tower's creator, Stan Chekik's inspiration for the ride came from his children. I've raised nine rugrats, nine curtain crawlers, nine house apes, whatever you want to call them. And every single one of them, you pick them up a little bit. As they get a little older, you just throw them a little higher and catch them. All I was doing is taking the adults and throwing them you know, 180, 200 feet in the air a little faster. And so that's how it evolved. It's just that that's what creates thrill. Then we sat down the team, a lot of great engineers. How can we create that ride? Not let's build a ride, but how can we create that thrill? And that's exactly how that came about. This ride is um, really interesting because it's all powered by air. Essentially, the uh, car vehicle is weighed, and they determine the weight of the passengers, and then it's driven up uh, to the top with a small amount of air. Um, the calculations it makes based on the weight or how much air it will store so that it can launch the vehicle. When we get to the very top, we'll be held by four little mechanical brakes. This is what I like best about it. I like being able to look out and see the park. I don't know, I just can't stress it enough how, you know, you get up here and you almost want to stay up here because it's so beautiful. Essentially, this ride, again, is, is all powered by air. We locked into the mechanical brakes at the top, pressurized the system. What I really like is just the, the rush of your, your butt coming off the seat, and then you just go and, you know, straight down. We'll um, launch when the, when the four valves throw and throw all the air from the shot tanks into the main tank for the launch. It traps air at the bottom, and we act uh, like a big spring that coils us or shoots us back up toward the air, and then cushions this nice and softly all the way to the ground. Ah! That's the best part. <laughs> That's definitely the best part. And then these little ones going up and down is really fun. I've been on every ride in this park and this is definitely one of my favorites because you get that that, that instant rush as soon as you your butt lifts off the seat. It's a lot of fun, a lot of fun. The other two towers, colored red, use the same technology to blast passengers up. I'm gonna get whiplash. Clear. No, not clear, not clear. <laughs> It's into the limelight of the industry, with both car owners and thrill riders enthusing about his novel compressed air system. Basically, how it works is you have cylinders, you have a, a, a series of them, so you got safety. You got these cylinders inside the cylinders, a piston, and then and it pushes the cable, and the cable is what moves the car, the gondola, or whatever you're on. Basically, it's really simple. It's move the piston, move the cable, move the person. So you, you pump up the air, you got an air tank or a storage tank, you call it accumulator, pump all that energy in there. Right when you're ready to go, boom, you release all that energy and push that piston one way and you go the other way. As the rides have become increasingly sophisticated, maintenance has become more important than ever before. Every moving part is checked and checked again every single day. Park owners know that a serious accident would probably result in financial ruin. As a result, the manufacturers build large safety margins into their rides. 
On the power tower, the cables which support the riders are a vital component, so they have a particularly detailed inspection. Well, I run my hand down the cable. I'm looking for any kind of imperfection as far as like a little bump in the cable or anything. If that's found, the inner core of the cable has damage and we will be taking this cable off and replacing it. The theme park industry prides itself on its safety record. Statistically, you're a million times more likely to die driving to a theme park than traveling on any of the rides. At the Power Tower factory, standards are regularly monitored and improved. Each batch of cable is tested to destruction. This cable is designed to have a breaking point 10 times greater than is needed on the ride. In this test, the cable broke at 17,000 kilos, the weight of two double-decker buses. Components in thrill rides must pass stringent fail-safe standards. And when you have a ride that blasts you to 190 kilometers per hour in four seconds, they need to. This is today's ultimate ride, Top Thrill Dragster. It's the fastest and tallest thrill ride in the world, shooting you up 128 metres, more than twice the height of Niagara Falls, in just eight seconds. Are you ready for the highest and fastest coaster in the world? Are you ready for Top Thrill Dragster? been described by some as better than sex. Riders strap themselves into cars resembling top fuel dragsters. They're then accelerated to 190 kilometers an hour in a mere four seconds. But unlike a conventional dragster, the cars then zoom upwards, rotate, ride the crest of the curve, crash down vertically, twist once more, and finally reach 190 kilometers per hour for a second time. Dragster is an experience that people don't forget. Oh, that was amazing! Dragster rider, how was your record breaking ride? Oh, that was so This is the view from the front row, and it's not been edited, sped up, or altered in any way. From a safety standpoint, the ride is extremely safe. The launch has to be between 120 and 122 miles an hour. A difference of two, one, you know, one mile an hour at that point would either cause a rollback or, or an overspeed going over the tower. From a rider safety standpoint, we have an individual seatbelt that locks uh, on each passenger. It has twin locks in each buckle. So no single buckle failure or single lock failure in a buckle would cause a, a safety problem. 
On top of that, we have an individual single lap bar that comes down in the passenger's seat, has two locking cylinders on it. No single cylinder failure would cause the lap bar to open up. So you have to have at least two cylinder failures before you have any problems. To create the extraordinary propulsion system, the designers adapted and combined two existing technologies. They used hydraulics with pistons pushing oil to launch the cars and magnets to stop them. The hydraulic system is essentially a, a really, really uh, simple system. It pumps oil out of a tank up into four accumulators and they put it into very high pressure oil. You know, it's, it's like a, a 250 bar. And essentially, they pump that oil in there and pump it up against nitrogen, which is compressed and acts like a spring. On a signal, the oil is released and runs through 32 hydraulic motors that creates a zero to 120 mile an hour launch. Arms down. The trains are um, stopped with a whole series of magnetic brakes that are all mounted to the bottoms of the trains. During the launch, you'll see a whole series of copper alloy fins drop down below the train. And when the copper alloy fins are down, then there are no, uh, nothing breaking the train, nothing slowing it down. When the copper alloy fins are up, they interfere with a magnetic field between the magnets, and that brings the train to a halt. Ride. You want to ride that one over and over again. Oh, yeah. Clear. Head back. Right. Hold on. Very scared. <laughs> Gotta hold on tight here. Arms down. Just arms down, head back, and hold on. Waiting for the Christmas tree to count down. The magnetic brakes are gonna drop. We roll back a little bit. We're about to go. There we go! Feet. Yeah. Over the top! Coming down! Oh my goodness! Oh. Oh. Don't go straight down! Clock screwing! Oh. 120 miles an hour! Oh. That's it! Yeah. The best ride ever. <laughs> How long Top Thrill Dragster will hold its world record is uncertain. With Thrill Ride designers continuing to push back the limits of technology, the possibilities are endless. Stan Checkets is clearly relishing the challenge. It's always higher and faster, it always will be. I don't like limits, do you? So what will the next ultimate ride be like? I can give you a hint, absolutely, it's gonna be awesome. <laughs> Hold on to the grab bar until the ride comes to a complete stop.